Welcome to the Perspectives on Healthcare podcast, where members of the medical community from different roles, venues, and locations share their unique perspectives on quality healthcare, its future, and how to improve it. Now, from the Your Keynote Speaker Studio in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here is your host, Rob Oliver. Thank you for being with me today. My guest is Gary Baldwin. He brings a chiropractor's perspective on healthcare to the program, and he is from Washington, the state of Washington, often confused with Washington, D.C., but um, nonetheless, he is uh, he is a baby boomer. Do I have that right, Gary? You you remember? Absolutely. All right. I think I'm a young baby boomer, but I'm a boomer. <laughs> All right. Um, and uh, he joins me today. Gary, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. I'm delighted that you're here. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your role in healthcare? Well, I'm here today because... Uh, to some degree, I'm representing the Washington State Chiropractic Association um, as its past president. Um, I'm also a chiropractor that's been in practice over 35 years in a city called Kent, Washington, just southeast of uh, Seattle. And uh, I think I bring a unique perspective on healthcare from a chiropractic perspective, which is unique, and from a political perspective, because I've been so involved in the politics of Healthcare from that perspective for a very long time. Actually, I've I've not really considered the concept of the politics of healthcare. Can you elaborate on that just a little bit? Yeah, it's really kind of interesting because um, I spend a lot of time uh, in Olympia. Obviously, not in the last year and a half, but in Olympia, which is our capital, and we have agenda items, uh, most often inclusion and healthcare policies and reimbursement. Um, And we spend time speaking to legislators based on bills that we present or that other professions present that we support or don't support. And it's interesting behind the scenes where we're in support of something that we believe benefits our patients and an insurance company on the opposite side. Um, And remember, it's my perspective is thinking, well, this is just going to cost us more. We're really not going to support that. Um, And we have this kind of Uh, behind the doors, I don't want to call it fighting, but disagreement in terms of what's going to happen for what we believe is a patient benefit. So there's the kind of behind the scenes side of of healthcare, the politics behind it. Okay. And I'm going to ask you an honest question. and, uh, And that is a lot of people, when they talk about chiropractors, they say chiropractor is not a real doctor or uh, can you can you talk about the practice yeah. of chiropractic as it relates to healthcare and kind of lay the groundwork as to what you're providing and you know how it benefits the people that visit you? Absolutely. And I'm going to do it from a COVID perspective, if that's okay with you. Chiropractors are not medical doctors. And in a lot of people's minds, when you say you're a doctor, they go, well, you're not a real doctor, implying that you're not a medical doctor. And I am totally good with that. I am not a medical doctor. Uh, I have a huge regard for medical doctors. I have no intention as a chiropractor of kind of creeping into their scope of practice is the word that we like um, to use. And so as a chiropractor, uh, what we focus on is spine health, musculoskeletal health. And from a COVID perspective, let me explain why that differentiation is important. We were considered essential healthcare providers during this whole COVID uh, episode. And the reason for that is because we did not want people with musculoskeletal problems, primarily back and neck pain, going into emergency rooms where medical doctors were caring for medical issues, which were sick people, flu, COVID. And by incorporating chiropractic with people in pain, a non-pharmaceutical approach, we were able to take care of people, keep them out of emergency rooms, keep them out of urgent care, and provide that service, which lessened the burden on the medical community. So we are a drugless profession. We've been around since 1895. Our specialty is musculoskeletal. Our focus is the spine and the mechanism mechanisms of making the spine work more properly, function better, and people that have healthier spines have less issues with back pain, muscle problems, strength, gait, all of those things. And so we 
Uh, I think 80% of Americans at age 50 have back pain. So we've got quite a group of people that we take care of. And that's just one segment. We deal in nutrition. We deal in athletics. It's really a wonderful profession for that. My daughter's a chiropractor, deals in chiropractic pediatrics. That's another discussion if you want to have it. So there's a broad scope of chiropractors uh, and what they do. I appreciate the explanation. What does quality health care mean to you? Well, I'm really big on certifications and licensure. And so when I talk about quality, um, I'm talking about any healthcare provider that meets the standard based on our codes. And I'll just say the state of Washington. So a chiropractor that um, is following all the laws and all of the codes is providing quality chiropractic care. So that's just kind of a definition. But I think what quality care is, is a, a chiropractor who listens to a patient, understands what the patient's problems are, if the chiropractor can deal with that patient to deal with it, if the chiropractor cannot deal with it, make sure that they get that person to the appropriate provider. And I really believe chiropractors are good at that. Hey, this is out of my realm. Let's get you to somebody different. So quality is listening, providing good care, and referring when you can't do that. A wonderful definition. Uh, Can you give me an example of quality health care. Um, we had a patient in um, a couple of weeks ago that had significant um, mid-back pain. Um, one of the things chiropractors do is we will take an x-ray of the area that we're concerned about. Um, so we do a thorough history. We do a thorough exam. And it really appeared that this person had something that chiropractic was going to be able to deal with. So many people today have a lot of mid-back pain specifically because of a job like yours. They're sitting at a desk, they're behind a computer, their head falls forward, causes headaches across the base of the skull and mid-back pain. So this is just a routine example of uh, the kind of people we talked with, didn't think anything of it, but we did take the x-ray because that's a really cautionary thing to do. Looked at the film and this poor guy had a gigantic tumor in his lung, easy to see, and they're usually not that easy to see. So quality healthcare was knowing immediately that this is not something that I'm going to be able to deal with. Secondarily, not saying something to the patient, because I believe that that's not my scope to do that, but immediately calling his primary care provider and saying, this is what we found. The wonderful part of technology, we were able to email the x-ray immediately. Uh, and very sadly, he has cancer, but he's in the right hands at the right time. So that's an example of interprofessional cooperation. And on the other hand, quality healthcare is exactly the same example, but the person doesn't have a tumor. They have terrible posture. They've got degenerative change in their neck. A chiropractor can evaluate that, care for them with adjustments and exercise and at-home procedures. And that person now sits taller, has a lot less pain, and in a huge opioid epidemic is not on any kind of medication. In my mind, that's quality health care. Right. Thank you. I, I think it's so interesting what you say. Your example of quality health care is one in which it's interdis, interdisciplinary uh, cooperation. It's not yes. about saying, like, look at the great job that I did. It's about right. saying the patient is at the center of this. And based on what the patient's needs are, if we are meeting the patient's most immediate needs, that's providing quality health care. I think it's a very interesting and um, an appreciated perspective. Yeah, I agree 100%. Uh, what do you wish that people understood about your role in healthcare? I think a lot of people, just as, if, as in the first question you asked me, um, hey, are you a real doctor? I do think that as chiropractors really only take care of about 20% of the population, there's a lot of people out there that have absolutely no clue what chiropractors do. And I wish more people understood what we do and the role we play. And we try, the vast majority of patients that we see in our office are referred patients. I mean, imagine the contrast. Pharmaceutical companies spend about $10 billion a year marketing. Um, Boy, we just don't do that. We we rely on referrals. And so I do believe if somebody in the universe said, here's $10 billion talking about chiropractic, I think things would change. I do know that out of my 35 years of practice, that things have become so much better in terms of working with 
the medical profession. There's a lot of orthopedic surgeons now that will refer to us. We refer back. We have good relations with family physicians from a personal perspective. I think on a political perspective, if the medical profession could take over the world and kind of eliminate everybody else, I think that they would do that. But that's just not how it works. Patients have a great deal of input in that. So my wish is that more people understood what chiropractors could do uh, for them. Excuse me. Yeah, no, I, no problem. I, I guess there's a, a bunch of myths that kind of exist mm -hmm. about chiropractic. And I'm just, I'm wondering, I'll give you a chance right now. If there's a, if sure. there is one myth about chiropractic that you say, I would really like to explode this myth. What would it be? Uh, that if I crack your neck, I'm going to kill you. Okay. I've rendered literally, we tried to figure it out one day, something like 5 million adjustments over my 35 years. And I've been very fortunate. I haven't, I, I just haven't been able to kill anybody. So we are an extremely safe profession. For sure, we've got issues. One of the big issues is non referral. You know, everything after the fact makes sense. You've got somebody in with a severe issue in their low back, cauda equina syndrome is one of them. You're adjusting them because you've done it a thousand times before. And it turns out, oh my God, this guy's got a severely uh, uh, extruded disc and an adjustment was completely inappropriate. Well, nuts. Now I know, but I didn't know before. So um, uh, chiropractic is extremely safe. We have extremely low malpractice insurance, which is fantastic. And those two things go hand in hand. So I think people need to know we're very safe. And here's an interesting thing. They have alternatives. People think the only way you can adjust somebody's spine is by cracking or getting that audible. And modern chiropractic, there are many tools available, instrument adjusting for one where you never even hear an audible and you still get a very positive result. So um, that's, I think, where I would go with that. Okay. What excites you about the future of healthcare? <laughs> That's a big question. You know what? Nothing. And I'll tell you why, <laughs> because I talk to a lot of different doctors and I take a doctor perspective and I take a patient perspective. And I'm honest when I say I don't like insurance companies. I know they have a job to do and I'm thankful for them. Uh, I've been very fortunate in my life and haven't had to utilize them. But the problem I see with healthcare today um, is I do believe that it's very pharmaceutical driven. I, when was the last time you went to your doctor and you did not get a prescription? When did it, you just, mm. everything is all about the next drug. It's on television. It, I, kids just are being inundated with this. And I think where I'm so disappointed with healthcare is, is that, that we don't talk about lifestyle. We don't talk about nutrition. It's kind of a second thought. Um, we look at obesity in America. I mean, you look at, you, you look at COVID right now, the vast majority of people that have succumbed to COVID had a comorbidity, number one being diabetes, which is right in there with obesity. It, it's so sad to me. And so I'm sad that we're in such a pharmaceutical route and much less into a kind of a take care of yourself route. Um, but I think the public is kind of catching on to that and doing a better job. Um, one thing about healthcare that I think is good is I do believe technology is helping because people have a little more control over the healthcare. They can communicate via email. Doctors are a little bit more open to somebody saying, hey, I saw on WebMD, can you explain this to me? I think the future of healthcare that's optimistic is people are becoming a little bit more involved and in asking more questions and doctors are getting a lot better about being open to answering those questions. It's not so uh, uh, kind of dictated by the doctor anymore. It's so interesting because what I hear you say is there are two sides to it. One is that people are becoming more empowered where they're doing their research, they're going out and asking the questions now. And people are also becoming less empowered by saying, okay, I, I don't want to actually make change. Just give me a pill that can change this instead of me having right. to. Uh, um, and so it, it it's a double-edged sword. It cuts both ways. Yeah. So, so such an interesting, uh, interesting dichotomy that you lay out there. Uh, what is one thing medical professionals can start doing today to improve the quality of healthcare? Listen, listening to patients better. Everything's, I have a friend that's um, an ear, nose and throat guy, and he sold his practice to a big group. And he went from 15 minutes per patient down to seven minutes per patient. And he walked into the, 
administrator's office and said, hey, I've done this for 25 years on my own. I had 15 minutes. The seven minutes isn't enough. And the administrator pretty much said, that's the way it is. And so reimbursements have become reduced in, at every level. So I know people are paying more for insurance, but the doctor's reimbursement is going down significantly. Uh, things that you used to do routinely, you can't do anymore. And now you're having to spend seven minutes with the patient rather than 15. And not only that, you've got to document in a way that you've never documented before. This electronic healthcare records are so arduous, a lot of chiropractors, the boomers like me, are literally retiring because communication is cut down. I'm spending time on a computer. I can't look my patient in the eye. And so if we could do anything better, it truly would be to listen more um, in the amount of time that we have and try to provide that same service that you did before. And listening has become just critical. So we got to work on it. Yep. I think a a very powerful message and a, a very important reminder of just how how it's about if you listen it's the patient expressing what's going on and it it becomes yeah. less about the less about the medical professional and it becomes all about the patient because ultimately without patients the medical profession goes away uh, i know but you know it's so difficult too because you want to take care of that patient and we are beholden now to the insurance company ask how many of your doctors literally work on a cash basis and can run their practice the way they want I'm fortunate because I have, I'm a a sole proprietor. I still own my practice and I can run it the way I want. And as a more mature chiropractor, um, I've lessened the number of people I see so that I can provide the service that I always have. But younger chiropractors are really working hard and they have to increase volume just to pay the bills because reimbursements have come down. What does that mean? Patients suffer, in my opinion. So healthcare today, that's a real problem. Uh, jamming everybody and cramming it all in, trying to get it done so that you can, you know, make this buck. And it's economically driven in a way I don't like. A very fair, uh, a very fair assessment. So listen, Gary, thank you so much for being here. I, I want to say I appreciate your perspective on healthcare. Thanks for listening to Perspectives on Healthcare. Visit PerspectivesOnHealthcare.com to learn more about Rob Oliver or to subscribe so you never miss an episode. If this podcast was valuable, we'd appreciate a review on iTunes. Or if you tell a friend or coworker about the show, that would be helpful too. Join us again next time for more Perspectives on Healthcare.